Hemolytic anemia is a form of anemia where red blood cells are being destroyed inappropriately. Hemolysis refers to the destruction of red blood cells, which will cause hemolytic anemia if it occurs faster than the bone marrow can reproduce red blood cells. The mechanisms by which hemolytic anemia occurs can be divided between extravascular and intravascular, where extravascular means that the destruction of the red blood cells is occurring outside of the vasculature, which is mostly mediated by immune cells such as macrophages in the spleen. Alternatively, it can be intravascular, where the destruction of the red blood cells is happening within the blood vessel. Extravascular causes can be further divided into extra or intracorpuscular, meaning something externally is affecting the red blood cells or that there's an intrinsic defect in them. So, extracorpuscular causes include malaria, hypersplenism, which is an increased activity of the reticuloendothelial system, or sequestration in the spleen. Or we can have warm and cold agglutinin disease, where IgG against the red blood cells are released and bind red blood cells, signalling them for destruction by reticuloendothelial cells. Intracorpuscular causes mean that there is a defect in the red blood cell. This could involve hemoglobinopathies, such as sickle cell or thalassemia, cell membrane defects, such as hereditary spirocytosis or elliptocytosis, and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Alternatively, we can have enzyme deficiencies, such as glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, also known as G6PD for short, and pyruvate kinase deficiency. Now let's move to the intravascular hemolytic anemia. Here, the hemolysis is occurring within the vessels themselves. So we can have that from mechanical stress, for example, from prosthetic heart valves, aortic stenosis, or even dialysis. We can have it due to an incorrect transfusion, for example, ABO or rhesus incompatibility. Then finally, we can have it through microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, such as diffuse intravascular coagulopathy or thrombogenic thrombocytopenic purpura and even lupus. Clinical features include the general manifestations of anemia, such as pallor, fatigue and weakness, dyspnea, headaches, and dizziness. But due to the increased destruction of the red blood cells in hemolytic anemia, we also see some other features, such as jaundice, that occurs because the hemoglobin released when the red blood cells die can get broken down, specifically the heme portion being broken down into bilirubin, which will give the yellow appearance of the skin and sclera when levels get above approximately 3 mg per deciliter. Dark coloured urine may also be seen due to hemoglobinuria. Gallstones may also be seen as the increased levels of bilirubin mean more bilirubin is moved into the biliary system. Additionally, long term elevated release of free hemoglobin has been linked to pulmonary hypertension, which could lead to right sided heart failure symptoms. In terms of diagnosis, you may suspect the patient has anemia from the clinical features. Hemolytic anemia clues may also include things like a worsening with consumption of flavor beans, which is indicative of G6PD, or a history of transfusions or even foreign travel. Peripheral blood smear may show schistiocytes, which are fragmented red blood cells that have been cleaved or sliced. You may also see spherocytes, which are spherical shaped red blood cells. Lab investigation mainly features CBC to establish the presence of anemia as well as to evaluate MCV, the mean corpuscular volume, which is often normal between 80 and 100 femtoliters. More specifically for hemolytic anemia, bilirubin levels will be increased as it is a degradation product of heme, haptoglobin levels will be lower as haptoglobin binds to free hemoglobin in the blood and then the complex is broken down by macrophages. So having more free hemoglobin in the blood due to red blood cell destruction means more haptoglobin binding and getting destroyed. Lactate dehydrogenase is present in red blood cells, and so when red blood cells are destroyed, lactate dehydrogenase is released. So in hemolytic anemia, levels will be increased. Reticulocyte levels will also be increased as the bone marrow tries to produce more red blood cells. Following that, Based on your suspicions, you could do further tests like screening for sickle cell or G6PD or the direct and indirect Coombs test for autoimmune hemolytic anemia. 
The Coombs tests are a pair of tests used in immunohematology. There's the direct Coombs test that is used to look for the presence of antibodies on red blood cells that might be causing them to be signalled for destruction, while in the indirect Coombs test, we are testing for antibodies that are in the serum. So how does it work? In the direct Coombs test, we take a sample of our patient's blood and wash it in order to remove all the unbound antibodies in the sample. The idea then is that only antibodies already bound to the red blood cells are still present. Then we add in anti-human globulin, known as Coombs reagent, that basically binds to the antibodies that are bound to the red blood cells. So what we actually see is that the red blood cells will stick together or clump together if antibodies are present on the red blood cells because Coombs reagent will bind to them and this then forms a link. Overall then, the direct Coombs test is looking for the presence of antibodies already bound to red blood cells in a sample of blood taken from our patient. The direct Coombs test is used when we suspect that an immune reaction or immune mechanism is targeting the red blood cells of the patient, for example in hemolytic disease of the newborn or warm or cold immunohemolytic anemia. The indirect Coombs test instead, we take the serum of our patient and mix it with foreign red blood cells. Then we add Coombs reagent and if any antibodies in the serum have bound to the red blood cells, then we'll see the red blood cells clumping together just like in the direct Coombs test. So overall for the indirect Coombs test, we're testing for the presence of antibodies in the serum of our patient that will then bind red blood cells. Applications for the indirect Coombs test include antenatal screening for the rhesus antigen in order to prevent hemolytic disease of the newborn, as opposed to diagnosing its presence like in the direct Coombs test. The indirect Coombs test is also used for testing prior to a blood transfusion. Treatment-wise, what we do depends on what's causing the hemolysis. It may be beneficial to give folic acid as a prophylactic measure as active hemolysis consumes it. You may give corticosteroids if the cause is an autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and rituximab has also been shown to be effective if steroids are not working. Other options include blood transfusions, plasmapheresis, and even bone marrow stem cell transplants.